Hello and welcome to In the Making, a series of virtual conversations from North Bennett Street School where we connect with a range of new voices, fields, and perspectives. My name is Kristen Odell. I'm a staff member and host of In the Making here at NBSS. America's first trade school, North Bennett, was founded in 1881 by visionary educator, philanthropist, and suffragette Pauline Agassiz Shaw. Today, we're known globally for a range of programs and courses and hand-based craft and trades, which help folks achieve meaningful <laughs> careers or even just learn some new skills. We also connect with like-minded organizations from schools and museums to nonprofits and community service orgs. As NBSS and other institutions grapple with how to be more diverse, equitable, and inclusive, we've come across multiple resources aimed at making our fields and education in general more welcoming and accessible. Which brings us to our program today, In the Making with Crafting the Future. We're joined here today by Corey Pemberton and Annie Evelyn, co-founders of Crafting the Future, Aspen Golan, CTF founding member and graduate of NBSS, Meg Miles of Yaya, a youth arts center in New Orleans, and Shimani Brethwaite, CTF intern and beneficiary. And please tell me if I just botched your last name. Um, Brethwaite. Thank you. So I'm just gonna sort of throw a question out there. It's simple and let's just go with it and <coughs> see where we go. So my first question is pretty straightforward. CTF for, for Corey and Annie, tell us your origin story. Sure. Um, she's pointing at me, I think. <laughs> so um, I guess, where should we start? So I'm Corey for everybody. Hello, Corey Pemberton. And um, Annie, Evelyn, and I met at Penland School of Craft about five years ago. And um, Annie was a resident, artist in residence there at the time. And I was living in the area, uh, working for various artists in different capacities. But um, we had both been to Penland at that point in several capacities and, um, you know, had, had been having lots of discussions about representation and uh, the lack of diversity in terms of, you know, ethnicity and race in our field, um, you know, not just the field of craft, but art and design as well. And uh, it was one, one night <laughs> when we were, we were actually in New Orleans at Mardi Gras. And um, after a series of sort of particularly heated discussions about that topic, um, you know, the lack of racial and ethnic diversity in our field, uh, we, we landed on the idea that we ought to do something about it rather than just talking about it like we had done so many times before. And so we decided that we were gonna start some sort of organization that banded together artists who had a shared concern for this um, lack of diversity. And we didn't know exactly what we were gonna call it at the time. We actually were mulling over a few different things that night and uh, stopped at something. We, the first idea we came to was black craft. And <laughs> we decided for multiple reasons that that wasn't gonna be great. We actually, we Googled it and that's sort of like a, a witchcraft um, organization already. So <laughs> after a little bit of workshopping, we ended up on crafting the future, but it would be at that point a few years before we really got things moving. Um, again, Annie was in her residency and I was all over the place. And um, it wasn't until a couple of years later uh, when Annie was actually living in New Orleans that uh, she had this brilliant idea that we should partner with youth arts organizations and um, enter Yaya and the relationship with Meg Miles. Uh, it was, it was so, something so simple yet so effective that we figured out in that moment was that, I mean, Annie and I had already identified the craft school experience as being a, you know, a transformative one and a viable path into the field. And so if we could just connect a few dots, <clears throat> you know, bring this experience that we know and love to uh, you know, more underserved communities that might not know about those experiences or have access to them. Um, and, and then you know, we've got all of these youth arts organizations around the country like Yaya who 
have been doing this work to bring arts education to underserved communities for years. And so they already have large diverse student bodies that could benefit from these opportunities. And so that's sort of where it was born from. Um, the first initiative was to start a, we did a Kickstarter campaign in, what was that? Was that 2019? To raise, um, I'm looking over at my computer because that's where I can see everybody's faces. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did a Kickstarter campaign in 2019 to raise money to send two yayas to, uh, to Penland. And so we raised a little over $8,000 and um, we were able to send two students, Tyreek Connellar and Shanti Broom, to Penland and uh, they had a great time. And, you know, upon returning to, to Yaya, we got reports from Meg and other instructors that they had noticed like a significant change in just their, their workflow and their dedication to what they were doing. So much to the point where <clears throat> they actually ended up extending studio hours at Yaya so that they, the kids could work, you know, longer days into the night, sort of like they did at Penland. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's, that's where it began. And it's really developed into a lot more since then. Mm -hmm. You know, after we raised the money for those two scholarships, Penland saw a uh, big potential in what we were doing. And they decided that they ought to match our, our efforts. And so for this year, 2020, we were able to raise enough money for two students and they were going to match that. Unfortunately, coronavirus and, um, you know, happened and COVID summer had other plans for the students. So we had to come up with some other creative ideas. We did some Zoom workshops and a couple other things to support the kids that we were going to send to Penland. But in any event, um, that happened. Penland decided to match our efforts and are going to do so moving forward. And so that partnership formed and uh, has inspired lots of other partnerships to grow out of that. So, you know, it started with, you know, Annie and I and Yaya and Penland. And now we've got um, eight different schools that we're partnered with and four different youth arts organizations. And next year, you know, if all goes according to plan, we'll be sending 30 different students to eight different schools from four different youth arts organizations. Wow. Yeah. So this leads me back to Yaya, which was the question from Meg. Can you tell us about Yaya? I, I'm not totally familiar with it, so please tell us. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, so YAYA stands for Young Aspirations, Young Artists, uh, and it's an artist-founded organization here in New Orleans uh, that was started in the late 80s by an artist here named Jana Napoli, uh, and it was always a collaboration between professional artists and young people at its very founding. It, it's sort of based on the idea that young people know best what they need and what they want to do and that they should lead uh, the, the work that they're participating in. And our goal is to provide visual arts training in a huge range of media to young people. Uh, we now work with youth starting at age five all the way up to 25. Um, and we couple that visual arts training with leadership and life skills and entrepreneurial skills, uh, really focusing on teaching artists how to use the arts as a pathway uh, into their futures and into their adult lives. And, um, you know, when Annie came and sat down with us almost two years ago with this idea, it just fit so perfectly with what we're trying to achieve at Yaya. Travel has always been a huge part of our program. Uh, we work with a community of young people who don't often have ex the opportunity to travel. Uh, often they've never been on airplanes, they've never traveled without their families. Uh, and Yaya just like really fundamentally believes that getting outside of this city and into another place and into another culture and meeting people from other places is really a critical learning experience. So we've always had this program called Paint the World that sends uh, young people traveling in the summer and Crafting the Future was this beautiful extension of that. Um, and usually what we do is sort of guided groups who go to another city to work with an artist or group of artists. Um, we have this amazing alumni network that's all over the country. We have partner organizations um, around the world. 
Uh, but what was so cool about Tyreek and Shanti going to Penland is that they went on their own. It wasn't like a guided taking a group of teens somewhere, uh, you know, to sort of have the experience like you might have on a school trip. You know, we were saying you're young adults who are prepared to go have this different experience. And I think going together was really important to them, but then just being able to fully immerse themselves into Penland and they came back and had never been in a place where every other person there was thinking 24 hours a day about making art Mm -hmm. and was totally committed to uh, supporting each other and creating a community. I know that they're still in touch with people from Penland. It was just truly a transformational experience for them. Uh, And we're really, we were excited to be the pilot partner and to get to brainstorm with Annie and Corey in the early stages of this. and I think this is just going to be this gift to the organization forever that we get to, to be part of this amazing organization. Mm-hmm. Those two students in particular, how what what length of a program did they go to at Penland? What, what they, length was that? They were there for two weeks, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, I think when we're dealing with young people who are in school and have jobs, that was the right length of time. I think as the program expands, there could be ways for us to send people on longer programs. Um, Shanti, who was one of the students who went last year, a few summers ago had gone to New York with a group from Yaya for a week to do a project with the Lower East Side Girls Club. And they ended up keep, she ended up staying for a month and working in their sewing shop. Uh, and she just that summer was able to do it. So I think those longer experiences are great, but you also just can't like, overstate the importance of even a short experience at mm-hmm. a place like Penland. I mean, two weeks alone. I mean, that that's of such a short time, but it's it just a day alone there has such an impact. I mean, I, when I visit it, it's just, you know, any short amount of time will just, it's just a, it's a dreamy place. I, yeah, I, am, I am not an artist. I am an arts administrator to my core. And I spent one afternoon at Penland with Annie last summer and was like floating for weeks after being there. So uh, I can attest to that. Um, And I I just also think, again, when you're working with underserved populations and young people who just don't have these opportunities and at a place like, yeah, yeah, we're working with kids who come from dozens of schools all over the city And in a lot of ways, they're kind of the misfits in their schools and they're choosing to come to Yaya and create a community with, you know, other kids around the city. And that community is so strong. I mean, the Yaya alumni network is amazing. But to I think just to like have your eyes open to how many other people there are who think like you do and feel the way about the arts that you do and want to commit um, to these fields is just unbelievable. And and I also think, I'll just say one more thing, that I think that, um, you know, the beauty of crafting the future and working with people at a young age is that you're able to get this experience before you make a decision about going to college or going to art school or what you want to do with your life. And I think that just that two-week experience can shift the way that you feel about the future. And if you're someone who has always been local and has never traveled and has never thought beyond, you know, maybe a trade school or, uh, you know, working your way through college or something like that. It's just unbelievable to think about what your future can be when you get to do this when you're 18 or 19 years old. Absolutely. One of the um, connections for the, one of the reasons that I'm just, I love this conversation and this group and crafting the future and all of you is the importance of um, um, arts and um, crafting and hands learning hand skills for mental health, um, physical health, emotional health for any young person. I mean, that's where my, you know, that's, it's, it's mega. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you see it, uh, you spend a summer at Penland and you can, count the number of people whose therapists obviously sent them there. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true, Aspen? <laughs> yeah, for sure. 
I think yeah. you can also count the number of people who are going to be getting like less therapy while they're at Penland and afterwards. So, right. you know, healthy coping skills. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump over to you, Aspen. Um, you, so this summer you, um, when many makers jumped to sell their work to um, raise money for crafting the future and other groups. What was that moment for you? Like, like, you know, how did you make that decision and why was that important to you? I mean, I think a big part of it was just um, a deep gratefulness to Annie and Corey for doing what so many of us wanted to do and couldn't conceptualize. I mean, I think the awareness of the problem is so much older than this solution. Um, and, you know, I mean, not to say that this is even a solution, but I think that the shame and the, the discomfort and the anger that you experience like living and working at an amazing place like Penland that doesn't have the representation that it needs I mean, that kind of thing, it eats at you, you know? And I think that the more, um, the more that I've thought about it over the years, um, the more I have needed and wanted to find a way to connect the things that I love, which are making things with the things that I believe in. And that it's, it's very difficult sometimes, I think, at least for me as a crafter um, who makes like, you know, these one of a kind, relatively high end objects to expand my community in a way that is meaningful. Like I end up selling to a really select group of people. I end up um, working with a really um, like relatively non-diverse group of people. Like I learned in a very white school. Um, and so just seeing the opportunity to take something that I love, which is carving a board and turn that into something that was meaningful um, yeah, I mean, there was no question whatsoever. I was just, it's the thing that I had and I wanted to give it. Um, I'm planning on this next week, I'm making one of these Windsor chairs and I'll raffle mm. that off for crafting the future too, because why yeah. not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think like what Aspen just said, and it's like, you know, what Corey and I hoped would happen is just like, is right on point. It's like, people have been feeling, you know, all these feelings about their community individually. And it's like, this is what Crafting the Future does, is it en enables us to come together and, and try to make that change. And, you know, we, 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 we thought that, that other people felt that way, you know, from conversations that we had with other artists. But since we've started it, you know, people have written in like, oh, yeah, I, you know, when I went to Penland, I, you know, dreamed that I was rich and that I could, you know, pay for people to come. And, you know, it's like now I'm going to be a $25 member or $5 a month member or whatever and, and work towards that goal. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, money, money and donors and donations, that is huge, but so is the work and you all are the work, you know, crafting the future is the work and um, Aspen's the work and, you know, that's what's going to make things happen. And as you can see, I have the piece behind me and that is not to, you know, celebrate that I won. It's actually to, to reiterate the story that Aspen just shared of how, um, you know, just connecting the dots of what sort of one person makes a thing and another person um, can give a little money into a raffle and then it ends up as something that you live with as a living object and it's this full circle of sort of giving and thinking and processing and making. Yeah and that raffle too I think that it created just another tier and it creates another tier of giving you know I mean it's like you can do you can donate directly to Crafting the Future you can become a member but I mean there were like 800 individuals who bid on that piece and it's not for that piece you know it was it was a conduit for crafting the future you know it's mm -hmm. like people are people want to be a member of this organization they want to throw their support behind it and so it's like you throw a little object up there and it's just a target that people can throw their support at yeah yeah that's but it also happens to be something beautiful then that you that's that is made by hands right i mean isn't that kind of what we're here for yeah, and a lot yeah. of artists are, are don't have a lot of money. And so it's like the one mm -hmm. thing that they do have is their objects and paintings and stuff. Absolutely. So um Shamini, you're an you're an intern and a an artist. 
Can you tell me what you what crafting the future is for you and your role? Yes. So, um, yeah, I just recently started the internship with Crafting the Future. And for me, I feel like it's given me hope and fuel just to, to push my boundaries and also other artists who have been through the same experiences that I have. Um, I'm currently a student at Rhode Island School of Design and there's a huge lack of diversity there. Um, and I feel that, um, I feel like having an inclusive art education um, can help put an end to a lot of negative and racial and gender stereotypes, greatly benefiting um, creative growth of not only the students, but I think the teachers and professors as well. Um, I, I feel like I've had a lot of um, experiences with teachers that has kind of altered my mind um, in terms of my art and the lack of diversity that I've seen at my school, it can, like even subconsciously, it can change how you make, how you show your work. Um, I've felt that there's been a lot of um, awkwardness or maybe like silence when there's been black students making work about um, their culture, their race, and just being able to diminish that and kind of um, allow other artists and students to never let their skin be an obstacle in their art education and their creative career. I think it's so important. And I think what Crafting the Future is doing is honestly so beautiful. And I wish more schools saw that and encouraged that. So yeah, I'm very thankful to be a part of Crafting the Future and I think I want to I want to continue to be progressive in this way for the rest of my life. So, so and you how will be, girl. You will be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a part of what Annie and I envision for these internships and for anybody who goes through any sort of crafting the future programming is that you know we're now folding this sort of service oriented work into our practices and perpetuity moving forward and that the people who we serve and who are now part of our community will be a part for as long as we're you know completing our mission so you know this internship with Shamini is uh it's just a three-month internship but you know we're hoping to be able to propel her career and open up new doors and opportunities for her after her time with Crafting the Future. Um, and just to give you a little, a brief idea of like what that internship looks like for Shamini, um, we've sort of divided it up <clears throat> into these three different parts so that she's able to get a sort of full round view of what it looks like for us, specifically in our studio here in Los Angeles as, as makers. And so uh, she's, you know, joining the production glass blowing team for four hours a week. And then she's got uh, four hours a week where she's doing um, work for Crafting the Future, which is, it varies. Um, she's done lots of great stuff with social media and some sort of research and development stuff for the website and um, reaching out to different artists to join the network things like that. And then the last part is working with Cedric Mitchell, who is our um, opportunities and resources manager at Craft in the Future. And he runs his own business uh, as a, a glass maker and a, a candle maker. And Shamini has been working with him um, four hours a week doing that, that practice as well. And already we've gotten people um, reaching out on Instagram who like want to give Shamini jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like it's pretty awesome <laughs> that our our community is stepping up and i mean as you can see shamani is an amazing human being with lots of beautiful thoughts and visions and so it's, it makes sense that things are going to unfold for her i hope 
Mm -hmm. What I've heard um, from what you just said, Corey and Meg and, and Shamini, what you're, what you're learning right now, the, how, um, how much effort you put into teaching um, or preparing, preparing a young person for how to sustain a career in these crafts or in their arts. I mean, that's sort of a huge missing link that we see everywhere of how to, um, you know, recycle what you've learned, you know, perpetuate, like you just said, perpetuate the experience and the momentum and carry craft in the future on into your next roles and just keep perpetuating that. And, um, but have it sustainable for you, for your, your life and your career. Yeah, it's tricky. It's a, it's a large order really, but, um, something that we're working towards, you know, when we started crafting the future, the first thing we identified was that bridge that we were talking about earlier and, you know, carving pathways into the field. But now we're thinking a lot about like what to do once people have arrived, you know, how do we continue to offer sustained support, help them plant their roots and grow their networks. And so, you know, this internship program is just one of the many things that we've been working on. So stay tuned for mm -hmm. <laughs> more efforts for sure. And so, Shamini, how do you what, do you, what are your goals moving forward? I mean, how do you want to carry this through into your career? And also, uh, actually, another question in that question is, what kind of medium do you work in? Um, so the medium I work with kind of varies um, because um, my past work has been like ceramics, um, sculpture, um, did like painting and drawing, and now it's kind of progressed into glass blowing, which I feel like has been um, kind of like in, an extension of my previous work. And glass is something that I really want to incorporate to my work moving forward. And I think like my overall goal um, and what I've gained from crafting the future is to just keep, keep pushing and keep allowing myself to not let race or negativity or stereotypes get in the way of my making. And I think it's really important to share that and to create a community with other artists of color and to have and be a support system for artists, especially during a time like this with the pandemic. I've felt that a lot of my goals um, have completely changed. Um, but I feel like my life has become a bit unpredictable since COVID has happened um, in terms of the world and everything that's happening. And I think just allowing myself to stay center and grounded with my mindset and everything that I've learned and gained from the internship and from my education in school, I feel like it's just gonna allow me to constantly make and not let any negative mindsets form inside me. Because I, I do think that no matter what happens, art has always been a release for me and a way for me to express myself um, because I have always felt like I've never been a part of um, a community before due to the fact that I grew up in a predominantly white area and my school is predominantly white. Um, so like I said, to have Corey, to have Cedric and the Crafting the Future members as someone to help uplift me and make me feel welcome 
that is something I want to keep with me. And that's something I want to share with other people. So I'd say that is my overall goal is just to keep this mindset that I've had. Mm-hmm. Preach, girl. Thanks, Charmony. Oh, yes, yeah, thank you. you. You talk similarly about the better together and getting, you know, eight black glass blowers together for the first time. And ha- I mean, you had similar experiences of always, always being, we should talk about that. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have been blowing glass for 10 years and this job that I started in Los Angeles a year ago is the first one I've ever had where I worked with another person of color. <laughs> You know, it's an extremely whitewashed field, as we've been talking about, you know, the past 30 minutes. But um, yeah, and and what to Shamini's point, you know, representation is huge. That's something that we think about a lot in conversations that I've had with Meg and with Annie about, you know, just showing an example of makers of color to young aspiring makers of color could go such a long way just showing people an example of somebody in a field that they might be interested in entering that looks like them so that they know that these spaces are for them and that these opportunities are attainable. Yeah, and these things aren't happening because there are these gatekeepers that are choosing artists and work that make work that all look the same. And like, that's another thing that's really exciting to us about CTF is that, you know, we're eliminating the, the, um, application process because the, the youth arts organizations, the students, teachers, and administrators are the ones choosing the students who are going to go to Penland or go to a pre-college program or, or um, get a grant. And so it's like, you know, it's just eliminating that thing. I feel like Shamini was talking about that a little bit, like when people were making work that maybe people didn't, couldn't understand, you know, that then, you know, that's being pushed away. And it's like, a, a diverse, you know, the art field that we're aspiring to, to have is one that all voices are represented and, um, and celebrated. And it's like, it's- mm-hmm. so, so, so to say that you are crossing all different mediums, all different art forms, crafts, anything, anything goes, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 We've got uh, people in our network who are glass artists, furniture makers, uh, textile artists, ceramicists, you name it. So what are your, um, for for Meg with Yaya and Crafting the Future, what are your hurdles in, in this? And I know that might be like a long list, but you know, what's, what's something that's right in front of you that you're dealing with right now? Oh, well, I mean, for one thing, we, grew very fast this year and we um have signed on for more scholarships than we have money for so if you're watching this and you want to make a donation for us to run all the programming that we've already signed up for we're going to need to pay some more money i would say that's one thing i saw your tiktok video Corey. (laughs) i can't get the song out of my head since watching it either so thanks oh good drake makes it makes people pull their wallets out, apparently. <laughs> or you're going to have to do one of those every week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that's one hurdle that is, you know, a blessing in disguise is that we have so many in-kind donations that it's time for us to step up our game and, and match them um, out of our fund. Um, but yeah, and then there's the obvious ones, you know, that we're all dealing with right now, which is the, the pandemic, coronavirus, putting everything on hold. Um, you know, we had four students who were slated to go to Penland this summer and they weren't able to, but um, we've been working with Meg and people at Yaya to, um, you know, make sure that those kids are still getting something from us. Um, and so we had Cedric Mitchell and uh, Christina Cordova and uh, Sarah Beth Post all taught Zoom workshops to the Yaya's, which was um, looked like a great success. Um, and, you know, there's been some other things that have been like, we're, we're in the process of planning an event in New Orleans and it's sort of up in the air right now. <laughs> Cause at yeah, yeah. We, at, yeah, at, yeah, yeah. Cause we're, you know, not sure 
if we're going to be able to gather come spring 2021, um, if yeah. it would be safe to do so. Um, but if we are, make sure you stay tuned for that event because it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, something that we did first here in Los Angeles called Better Together. And the idea was to throw an event that celebrated black makers and provided them with a space to um, pop up and sell their wares free of charge. So we provided the space for a, um, basically a, a, a day long craft fair um, in our studio. But we also had all these black glass blowers from around the country come and do a demonstration and some workshops. And there were vendors, uh, food vendors and musical performers. And it was just a really good time. And we're, we're planning something like that in, at Yaya as well. Um, but again, we've got the, the coronavirus hurdle <laughs> to jump mm -hmm. first. Uh, um, we're so yeah. excited about having Better Together at Yaya because we have the only public access glass studio in New Orleans is in our facility. Uh, and it's been an amazing part of the organization for almost the last 10 years. But there is this divide because part of the way that the studio supports itself is by renting blow slots to working artists and fabricating work for artists. And that is so overwhelmingly white in New Orleans and the population that we serve doesn't look like that. And so I think that having Corey and Cedric and all these artists come to New Orleans, even though the yayas, which is what we call our young artists, have access to the studio all the time, they still don't see themselves reflected in the people working in the studio. So we're just beyond uh, thrilled about Better Together. Um, and I mean, I think hurdles, the money is always a hurdle. Uh, I think that with young people and COVID, it's been a lot different than we expected that it might be and sort of understanding the communities that we're working with and how hard those communities are being hit by COVID um, and how many young people in our program have lost family members or friends and how destabilizing it can be to not have school and not have that be mm -hmm. a place that you're going every day. Um, and it's interesting for some young people, creativity becomes the way that they're able to get through it. And for other people, it's just like creativity block and they're just trying to get through uh, sort of the day to day. So as this stretches into a year, it's been interesting to, to sort of see the ways that we can be supportive and how we need to adjust our programming to the needs um, of the community that we're serving. So mm -hmm. it's, been a, it's been an eye opener of a year for us. Um, but this Crafting the Future piece has been such a bright spot because we're seeing this generosity pouring out and this interest um, in helping young people thrive. And it's a nice sort of counterbalance to uh, an otherwise pretty crappy year. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And Meg and other people as well have let us know that this has been one of the most sort of sustained and successful fundraising efforts that they've seen. And that's something that we're really proud of and something that we want to keep going. And so that's a big part of our job and mission is to, again, you know, remind people um, that this sort of service oriented work is something that we have to keep up. Uh, it's not something, you know, we're not going to suddenly have achieved our goal overnight. Um, and so, yeah. yeah. And it can't just be doing. a reaction to some horrible thing in the news. Like this is a steady problem and we need to all just stay vigilant and like mm -hmm. work together to do it. But it's, I mean, I've been fundraising in the arts for 15 years, including with some pretty major national organizations and working with major funders. And like this crowdsourced thing is just so different than anything else I've seen. I mean, you know, we've all seen one Kickstarter campaign fund an independent film and that's one blip, but to see this continue to go on and on and sort of be fueled by an artistic community. And for me, sort of seeing the donations come in and see artists who are raffling pieces. And then all of a sudden that artist is sending us $5,000, which is not an amount of money that they would have been able to contribute on their own has just been um, incredible. And I think it speaks to just the, also the creativity of artists, like working within an organization and within sort of a set 
concept of what it means to like run an organization and fundraise. Um, like it took Annie and Corey kind of like coming in blind and being like, we're going to throw this out there and it's going to be, you know, like I couldn't have done that as a person trained as a fundraiser. You just, I needed this <laughs> other kind of inspiration to come in. So I think it also speaks to the importance of always having artists at the table for whatever you're trying to do uh, because this has grown in ways that I don't think a traditional organization could have possibly envisioned. Yeah, I mean, you just, you make me think of Aspen. You are one of the most creative people I know and your, your social media blitzes around this were just peak creativity and like the ultimate of what Meg's referring to. Well, I think that the ability to donate $3 and do it with just pure joy, knowing that at the very least, you've just given $3 to crafting the future. And at the very most, you're going to get this goofy object that's going to be both like, you know, an ornament in your home, but also a way to remember that there might actually be a way to do work as a collective that makes this feel like we, we're gaining ground. Mm -hmm. um, which I think, you know, Annie and Corey have again spoken to so well that this is not a problem that can possibly be tackled on an individual level. But at the same time, it paradoxically requires that we all act as individuals in perpetuity <laughs> in support of it. Um, and so again, like I think that these raffles and these objects, like they're just a chance to coalesce around a single object and remind people, okay, now is a moment to give. Like now is a moment to stand up again and try one more time and throw something else on the table. I mean, I personally am so excited about the idea of endowed scholarships at these schools because I hear how difficult it is to raise this money over and over again. And so the idea that there might actually be enough money that the money does the work mm -hmm. and produces these opportunities for students. I mean, I can't imagine anything better. And Meg, yes, like making a $2,500 donation I mean, I've never made a $2,500 donation in my life. You know, I mean, it was the most exciting thing I've ever gotten to do. I screenshot the donation thing so many times. It was the background of my computer. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I mean, I think this endowing idea is super interesting. I mean, the majority of arts organizations across the country, yeah, yeah, included, are essentially starting at zero every year and raising our full budget uh, sort of like grant to grant, month to month. And so I think this amazing groundswell at the outset of crafting the future allows the organization to think in different ways about what sustainability means. Uh, and I think we're probably facing a future where there may be a few less organizations than there were a year ago in the coming years. Um, and it's just really cool to think, to, to envision something from the outset with the concept of it continuing on. Yeah, and to that point, I mean, even institutions as large as like Pilchuck Glass School, who is one of our partners, have expressed a similar thing where it's like, people think that they've got all of this money, but it's difficult to, in that budget, find additional funds for things like this. Like there could be people who've been there for years who have wanted to institute scholarships for people of color on a yearly basis, but it's just like, where do they find that money? It's not always that simple. And just like, you know, youth arts organizations like Yaya yeah, yeah, might want to send their students to places like Penland, but how? And so that's where we step in. Yeah. And I think it's like the matching situation that we have with most of these schools makes that really appealing for them because they can, you know, it's like they have to account to somebody else so they can go back and say, well, we've got this group and they're willing to put in five, so we need to find this money. And, and it, you know, just inspires them to, to do it. I just, you know, about organizations and Meg saying there's going to be fewer, you know, we, Crafting the Future can't, like as we exist, cannot exist without these youth arts organizations all around the country. So if you're, you know, looking for other ways to um, support yeah, diversifying the field of art, craft, and design, like, you know, send money to Yaya, look for your local one and see, you know, see who's near you. And, you know, we, we need to support these organizations because they're not as, like, the thing about Crafting the Future is it's a selfish organ organization for artists because we are selfishly changing our own community, you know, we to, to, to what we want it to be. And so, you know, 
the the youth arts organization might be a less less uh, just as good and a little less selfish donation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't find yeah. that selfish. selfish. <laughs> earlier earlier on, I guess. <laughs> And for anybody who's interested in supporting either of these organizations, I saw a question about um, where to do so. And so if you look in the, the question and answers, I've linked both of our, our websites there. Oh, yes. And I was just going to read them out loud for you all. Um, but you, you read them out loud. Meg, your website is? Uh, it's yayainc.org. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll be launching our own virtual gala in another week and a half uh, with auction items from Corey and a lot of other great artists. Um, and it's actually sort of making a cool situation out of being forced to do a virtual event, which is that people from everywhere can tune in and get to meet some of our artists and see what they're working on. Um, we've teamed up with some local artists. Last night, one of our teens went and interviewed Brandon Odom's B Mike, who's become this internationally known muralist from here. And so a 15 year old in our program went and interviewed him and an alum of our program recorded it and we'll be showing that. Um, and then a lot of the kids will be sharing their bodies of work. So it's gonna be really fun. Yeah, yeah. And tell me, the, tell me the dates again. What are the dates of that? That's uh, November 18th is our virtual gala, so you know, that, that is a silver lining of COVID is getting this bigger reach and being able to bring in artists like Cedric and Sarah Beth and Christina, who we would not necessarily have been able to bring it, afford to bring in all of them in one year, but we got to zoom them in. Uh, mm -hmm. so you'll also see the work that the kids made uh, in those workshops. And we got to serve more students than we would have otherwise, you know, uh, tradition, originally it was four students that were supposed to go to Penland. And I think with the three classes combined were um, how many students Meg like almost 20 maybe probably uh, yeah probably and I mean I mm -hmm. I was looking today at the pieces coming out of the kiln from Christina Cordova's workshop and I mean they're just like not like anything that's come out of our ceramic studio ever before they are so cool um and we have an amazing ceramics teacher who is self-taught and learned a lot at Penland uh through work study and other programs and so she's done an incredible job with the program, but like having Christina do a week long intensive, it's like these pieces are just blowing my mind. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I hope to acquire at least one of them. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and so people can see those at the, the gala on the 18th. Yeah, and and we'll be sort of rolling everything out in our online store, uh, probably towards the end of next week. We're photographing everything and getting it uh, online. So you can go to the online store now and yes. buy Yaya's work. And yeah. Megan, is it too late for um, artists who are watching this to donate work to the, um, to the fundraiser? It is not too late. It is almost too late. Hang <laughs> <laughs> on hand, contact Yaya immediately. <laughs> um, so yeah, I can put my email in the chat, but um, yeah, I just, also just tune in because it's going to be really fun and yeah. the are amazing. Uh, and, and, it's and we're going to be dropping a new video that we just filmed last week with um, Shamini and Cedric in the studio, uh, which we're really excited about. So that'll be debuting nice. <laughs> at, the, at the event. And then we're going to round it out with a live performance from Tank and the Bangas, who are a great local band of young people who all came out of one of our arts magnet schools here and are taking the world by storm. So it's also just a celebration of New Orleans and like this incredible talent pool that we have here uh, across the board. So mm -hmm. in all disciplines. Um, while we're, while we're chatting, if any, if any of our guests have um, questions for our panelists, you can go ahead and put them in the Q and a window and we'll follow along. Um, and I just want to verbalize Crafting the Future's website. It's craftingthefuture.org. That's right. right. And um, there's lots of great resources on there as well. I mean, of course, you can head over there and make a donation, but you could also um, check out our exhibition that we have up right now called Postmarked. Um, it's you could so check beautiful. Out, it is. It's really great. Uh, we had submissions from... Um, over 300 artists, 400 submissions total uh, that came from around the country 
artists making four by six um, original works of art and then slapping a stamp on them, sending them to Penland in the mail for this exhibit. And so when you make a $30 donation on that page, we thank you with um, one of the cards from the exhibit. So if you're interested in checking that out, that's up there. Um, we've also got some great resources for artists of color. So if you are one and you're listening or you know somebody who could benefit from these opportunities, please direct them to uh, our resources tab on our website. Um, there's also a great network of makers of color up there. Um, there's a few woodworkers, uh, some ceramicists, glassblowers, uh, the whole nine. And the idea there just being, again, that we're offering continued support for these artists and celebrating makers who are already in the field. Um, so yeah, all of that at craftingthefuture.org. Corey, make a quick plug for your uh, cruise because I think that from a yeah. sort of fundraising and community building standpoint is like one of the cooler aspects of crafting the future. Yep, and sure. also, also that's that might answer if you talk about your cruise. That might answer um, Charlie's. Charlie just ch chimed in with a question about um, what being a member entails. I don't know if that might equate to a crew. Sure. So, um, well, I'll I'll answer the question about being a member first, which uh, is a short answer. And really, what being a member of Crafting the Future does for you is it invites you to be a part of this movement and to stay in the loop with all the great things that are happening. So when you fill out the membership form on our website, um, we'll ask you if you want to join our our news, um, our mailing list, which is not obnoxious. It's just once a month that we send out uh, an awesome little message about the fun things that we're up to. Um, and you're, you know, you're not necessarily getting a, a tote bag or a t-shirt in return, though those will be available for sales shortly. <laughs> Again, you're just getting that um, great satisfaction of being a part of this movement and this community and helping us to spread that. And one of the ways that we're asking people to help spread that is um, by forming crews. So the Postmark exhibition is actually uh, the first fundraiser put on by the Penland crew. Um, and what these crews are, are basically groups that are centered around anything from a geographical location to an institution to a medium. So there could be a North Bennett Street um, crew, there could be a you know, uh, Northeast Furniture Maker crew or whatever it might be. Um, and basically we ask that people assemble in groups of 10 or more um, virtually for now, obviously, and uh, organize fundraisers on our behalf and help build our community. And again, it's about, um, you know, folding this into our practice. It's something that Annie talks about a lot and that um, I've been thinking about a lot lately too is uh, you know, centering this idea of service um, it's over the idea of productivity. You know, we're taught so often to just like keep our heads down in the studio and make, make, make and get the next show and get the next this and the next sale. And um, we want people to start thinking about this type of work as just as valuable and um, fulfilling as that other thing. I love that, Corey. I mean, just 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 slowing down a little bit. I mean, we've all had to slow down this past year because of pandemic, and um, but that that's sort of a silver lining in that. And what you're saying is just slow it down a minute and make sure that what you're doing is has weight to it instead of just going after that next sale, sale, sale. Yeah. And I think some of these like ideas around like the perfect artist also are just you know, antiquated from a time when, you know, men would go off to work and, you know, somebody else would be taking care of everything else. And it's like, we all need to work together to take care of everything now, hopefully, instead of, you know, so it's like, we need to change that balance. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure there's going to be an NBSS crew coming up I at hope some so. point. <laughs> That'd be great. I'd like to join. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. yep. yeah yeah and I, so I, the way that the we started it was that it's actually pretty fun we all meet over zoom you know aspen's there and annie's there and um maybe like 12 or so more other artists and 
we just meet every so often and talk about what we're going to do. So we, you know, kicked around different ideas for fundraisers and sort of picked our top three. So we kind of already know what we're going to do next, um, roughly. And we just get to, you know, hang out and see each other. And it's, you know, it's actually really fun and heartwarming in, in this horrible time that we're living in to be able to have that moment of togetherness and um, creativity. Mm -hmm. it's wonderful and i thank you so much your your work is amazing thanks and thank you all for joining um thank you thanks to everybody for putting down the refresh button on our smartphones for this nice wonderful hour we can all go back to reality in a second and hopefully it'll be we'll see um but thank you all for being here thank, thank you, you all. appreciate yeah. you thank you yes thanks to you all and we will see you soon and thanks to all of our guests for joining us we appreciate it so much <laughs>